just read page rule 34, of course. But as we've seen, we didn't start the fire, so to speak. Well, who knows? Maybe it's just the eventuality of human imagination. Maybe it's the reaching out of humanity to the unknown. Maybe it's us trying not to feel so alone in the universe. I mean, as far as we know, we're the only life with our level of intelligence. Or maybe it's a subconscious reaction to the ever-present, if latent fear that maybe there isn't someone for each of us. No perfect match. Thus, we are compelled to create out of what is simultaneously known and unknown figures and people we can look at for comfort and at the same time the strangeness that brings unknown curiosities to our lives. Uh, last, but I wax, uh, last, uh, last, but I wax poetic. So, here's a look at these anthropomorphic creatures, and let's trace some of their origins. Obviously, there are a ton of creatures in this game, things like Medusa, or centaurs, or vampires, so what we'll do is we'll start with the recurring ones, and we'll broaden out and talk about some of those exceptions I mentioned before. Let's start with Alice. Alice is an echidna. No, go home, PowerPoint, you're drunk. <laughs> In this game, she's called a Lamia. The use of the word Lamia is attributed to this kind of monster. It's actually, as attributed to this monster, it's actually relatively recent. Originally, the category of monsters known as Lamia were sort of <coughs> vampire legend in ancient Greece. Uh, according to Greek mythology, they were named after the Libyan queen Lamia, who was a child-eating daemon. Note that daemons are different from the Judeo-Christian demons. That was weird. It is said that Lamia turned to eating children as revenge after Hera stole hers away, like, you know, God do. Uh, different myths describe Lamia's monstrous appearance and sometimes serpentine appearance as a result of either Hera's wrath, the pain of grief, the madness that drove her to murder, or in some rare version, a natural result of being a cake daughter. The popularization of the word Lamia came the popularization of the word Lamia to mean echidna, although it's thought to be due to a romantic poem published by John Keats in, 19, in 1890 called Lamia. And then in 1909, a painting called Lamia by Herbert James Draper featuring a woman wearing skin, wearing snakeskin like belt or sash. Actually, there were quite a few of painting, quite a few paintings like this at that time, so maybe it was just something in the zeitgeist. So what is an echidna? In Greek mythos, Echidna, that was her name, was known as the mother of all monsters, because most of the monsters in Greek myth were mothered by her. This is fitting, because Alice, as we come to find out, is the ruler of all monsters. But Echidna wasn't a metaphorical mother. She personally mothered many monsters, including Chimera, Cerberus, Scylla, and Sphinx. Echidna and her children lived in Amira, where she remained as a challenge for future heroes. That is the character Amira from the game. Elias, Ilias is our next is next on our trek, and you might already be familiar with her, even if you haven't played the game, particularly if you are a good Jew, because Elias is the female version of the name Eliah or Elias. According to the biblical book of Kings, as well as the Quran, Elias was a famous prophet and wonder worker in the northern kingdom of Israel during the reign of Ahab, which was supposed to be around the, uh, the 9th century BC. <clears throat> According to the books of Kings, Elias defended the worship of Yahweh over that of the Phoenician god Baal. He raised the dead, brought fire down from the sky, and was taken up in a whirlwind. References to Eli appear all over religious texts, such as the Talmud, the Mishnah, the New Testament, and the Quran. In Judaism, Eli's name is invoked at the weekly Havdalah ritual that marks the end of Shabbat, and in other Jewish customs as well, among them the Passover Seder and the Brits, where Eli is said to be present for. The ritual circumcision of the Brits is of particular importance here because a pivotal moment in Luca's story is that Elias doesn't visit the temple to bless him on his journey to become a, uh, a warrior. This blessing supposedly makes a hero semen taste like angel liver, protecting them in a way against monsters, uh, similar to how circumcision is thought to protect against disease. The bris and the blessing of Elias also act as markers of their respective religion, or respective chosen people. Physical for the Jews, before circumcision was commonplace anyways, and for heroes, well, apparently monsters can smell it. But the similarity goes deeper than that. Without Elias' blessing, 
Luca constantly thinks of himself as a fake hero. In spite of all of the heroic deeds he performs and the heroic ideals he believes in. Over the course of his journey, though, his vision of himself slowly changes as he realizes that he could be a good hero even if he wasn't blessed by Elias. This strongly echoes the reform and anti-circumcision anti movements in Judaism, as well as in humanistic Judaism, where non-circumcised but committed Jews are still considered Jews. Now, while strictly speaking they aren't monsters, it's worth talking about the four spirits. Having perhaps the strongest correlation with their in-game mythos and their real-world origins, Silt, Salamander, Gnome, and Undine each represent four of the elements of alchemy, wind, fire, earth, and water, respectively. In our, mytho in our mythology, sylphs are female winged air elementals, or fairies, with large glistening eyes and huge wings that can move as fast as lightning. Salamander is, first off, actually a salamander, uh, and described by Leonardo da Vinci as having, no quote, no digestive organs, get, and gets no food but from the fire in which it constantly renews its scaly skin." End quote. And it was later suggested to be an elemental. Fun fact, uh, early travelers to China were shown garments supposedly woven from salamander hair or wool. The cloth was completely fireproof and was very popular among those who could afford it. Pope Alexander III actually had a favorite tunic made from that cloth. Not so fun fact, um, they were actually woven from asbestos. Mm. So, yeah, cancer. Gnomes, according to myth, uh, are humanoid earth elementals. Uh, spirits about a foot and a half tall live underground and are very reluctant to interact with humans. Very much like their in very much like her in-game attitude. And I save Undine for last because it's Story time, boys and girls. Once upon a time, there was a water nymph named Undine. She was very beautiful and, like all nymphs, immortal. However, should she fall in love with a mortal man and bear his child, she would lose her immortality forever. One day, Undine fell in love with a handsome knight named Sir Lawrence, and soon they were married. When they exchanged their vows, Sir Lawrence said, Undine, as I take your hand in marriage, I vow to love you and be faithful to you with every waking breath, forever and always. A year after their marriage, Undine and Lawrence had a child together, but from that moment on, she began to age. And as her beauty diminished, Lawrence began to lose interest in his wife. One afternoon, on a walk near the stables, Undine heard the familiar snoring of her husband. Entering the stable, she saw Lawrence lying in the arms of another woman. Dun, dun, dun! Undine pointed her finger at him, which he felt as if he was kicked, and woke up with surprise. Furious at the infidelity of her husband, Undine says to him, You swore your faithfulness to me with every waking breath and I accepted your oath. So be it. As long as you are awake, you shall have your breath. But should you ever fall asleep, then that breath will be taken from you, and you will die. And that, boys and girls, is the tale of Ondine's curse, the historical name for congenital hypoventilation syndrome, in which, patients caught, in which patients are caused to lose autonomic control of their breathing, making them need to consciously control every breath. And it just so happens that Undine in the game has a grudge against humans and is the only one of the four spirits that if Luca can't, that will actually kill Luca if he doesn't defeat her. And a little vindictive, maybe, transmedia revenge. So, now, as it stands, all of the four elementals actually have one person to thank for their mythos and modern forms. 16th century German Swiss physician, <coughs> uh, physician, botanist, alchemist, astrologer, and general occultist, Paracelsus. His full name was, his full name actually, uh, was Philippus Ariolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. 
Hohenheim, aside from being the namesake of the father of Edward and Alphonse Elric from Full Metal Alchemist, may well have been the inspiration for Heinrich Heim, who in the game is the hero who mastered the four spirits 500 years prior to current events. So earlier I mentioned that this picture was that this picture of a unicorn centaur wasn't from Monster Girl Press. Uh, in fact, it's from something called Monster Girl Encyclopedia that was created by an artist named Kenko Cross. It's no surprise then, however, that Cross also works as an artist on the game, although not a big one. I think he's uh, his biggest contribution. I think was for the slimes and for Alice. Uh, now, if we could just take a break from all the history, and mythology, and psychology here for a second, we've been together for about a half hour or so, right? Um, and there's not a whole lot left of this panel, but let me just ask you a question. How many of you are feeling like you've been had? Like maybe you came here for this panel, supposedly promised a ton of boobs and TNA and stuff, and instead you actually learned something? Food for thought. <clears throat> Anyways, getting back on track, Monster Girl Encyclopedia, though being distinct and though all right, so being distinct and non-canonical with regards to Monster Girl Quest is obviously a heavy point of reference for the game. One of the most noticeable things in the encyclopedia is that there were many monsters that for the most part interact well with humans. In other words, they don't rape people immediately upon meeting them. It's kind of, you know, kind of a faux pas. And actually, many of them are quite amicable. Let's start with whole stars, which is ostensibly a type of minotaur. They are gentle, devoted, can live peacefully in human settlements. They ask for marriage rather than just dragging a guy off to a cave someplace. And, you know, there is actually the option to say no. Uh, if they want sex from their husband, the husband can say no, and no means no. Harpies, despite it being a pejorative term applied towards women in outdated Western nomenclature, <coughs> are actually quite cheerful. Uh, they get along well with humans and even sometimes show off their singing voices to pass to those passing through the mountain where they live. However, during their mating season, they will go and snatch up a guy to mate with. Uh, the most at danger are ones who have been friendly with them in the past. Lizard men, or lizard women, I guess, um, are strong, prideful, stubborn warriors, very much like Klingons. Uh, but despite their aggressive nature, they don't usually attack humans unless they've been offended. If you're a warrior yourself, though, she might challenge you to a battle. If you lose, she might beat you up a bit, but she won't go so far as to kill you. It's just not sporting. If you win, though, you might find yourself at the business end of a marriage proposal. The lizardmen want strong husbands, and if you can beat them well, you've proven yourself. Of course, you could always say no, but if you do, you'll probably find that she'll be following you around until you change your mind. They're rather determined like that. Which, as you can imagine, makes things a bit awkward if you want to go on a date with someone else. Rather than being awkward, however, Yukiona, or snow women, use guilt. See, if you're an unlucky adventurer who's gotten lost in a blizzard, you might find yourself being rescued by a Yukiona, a kind of spirit monster uh, that is cold to the touch. She'll invite you into her house, treat you to a home-cooked meal, entertain you as a guest. Now that you owe her something, not just by her saving, saving your life, but for being a gracious host, she'll ask that you repay her by providing the warmth of sexual intercourse. You could try to run away, but you might find that you keep it back at her place somewhere. You sort of redirected by the storm. Funny how that works. Once the formalities have concluded and she's gotten the gift of body heat, you're free to go. As you leave being a good host that she is, she'll invite you to return at a later date. There is, of course, Another, but different, story attached to the Yukiona. A long time ago, there lived two woodcutters, Minokichi and Mosaku. Minokichi was young, and Mosaku was very old. One winter day, they couldn't return home because of, guess, a snowstorm. They found a hut in the mountain and decided to stay there. On this particular evening, Mosaku woke up and found a beautiful lady with white clothes. She breathed on old Mosaku, and he was frozen to death. Then she approached Minokichi to breathe on him, but stared at him for a while and said, I thought I was going to kill you, the same as that old man. 
but I will not because you are young and beautiful. You must not tell anyone about this incident. If you tell anyone about me, I will kill you. Several years later, Minokichi met a beautiful young lady named Oyuki and married her. She was a good wife. Minokichi and Oyuki had several children and lived happily for many years. Miraculously, though, she didn't seem to age. One night after the children were asleep, Minokichi said to Oyuki, Whenever I see you, I'm reminded of a mysterious incident that happened to me. When I was young, I met a beautiful young lady like you. I don't know if it was a dream or if she was a Yukiona. After finishing his story, Oyuki suddenly stood up and said, That woman you met was me. I told you I would kill you if you ever told anyone about the incident. However, I can't kill you for the sake of our children. Take care of them. Then she melted and disappeared, never to be seen again. Of course, in the game, the Yukiona will kill your ass, and in that way is much more like her namesake than in much of Japanese culture. But from all of this, we do see creatures that act with a certain level of stability. And though it is not the norm, we see that in the game as well, most notably in the kingdom of Grand Noah, where humans and monsters get along, that there are cases where humans and monsters can live in near-perfect coexistence. Which brings me to one last question. Our monsters are the reflections of our cultural fears. Frankenstein was us being afraid of unbridled science, werewolves of our animalistic desires, and vampires our fear of the others who look and talk like this but are different, just waiting to strike. Even more modern media has, even more modern media has examples. For instance, in the anti-communist McCarthy-era America, popular science fiction was made to depict America under threat from alien invaders, some of whom looked just like us. After the bomb was dropped on Japan, they were dealing with the fears of the nuclear age. Godzilla appears to ravage Tokyo. So, if the monsters in the game aren't the ugly, traditionally terrifying type that we are used to, what are they now? What makes them scary? We know that this game is definitely more than what's on the tin, so let's drop the pretense that this is just a porn game and we don't really need to think about it. The principal danger in this game is that you will be sexed to death. But if you think about it, apart from prostitute quality testers, which are a thing, apparently, um, there's really no danger to that actually happening to us real people. So then, is, se is sex and sexuality the scary thing in and of itself? No. Maybe. I mean, after all, the word risque is the French word for risk. And apart from notions of propriety, sex is risky because it's about as intimate as you can get with someone. Because it takes trust to perhaps the highest degree because you are both naked and at your most vulnerable, both physically and emotionally. These monsters that take advantage of that vulnerability and make it, they take it and they make it how they attack you. And in generally reserved cultures such as Japanese and believe it or not in terms of sex, even American, this is a big thing to hit on as a fear response. There are even folk tales about things like vagina, vagina dentata, which a women's vagina is said to contain teeth, told as a cautionary tale warning about the dangers of unknown and loose women. And yet, as we've seen, we have a game in as we've seen, we have in-game examples of narratives, com of narratives combating that fear with places in the game that show peaceful living between humans and monsters. Maybe telling us that our fears may be unfounded, or at least not as bad as we think they are. So it's finally time for me to wrap this up in a nice little bow, in a nice little bow for all of you. Monster Girl Quest is a game where you play the hero in a world that is actively trying to rape the ever-loving fuck out of you. On the surface, it's a porn game, but if you actually think, if you actually understand that as art, it's a reflection of the cultures that bore it you'll quickly see just how much more than that it really is. Now, I'm not saying you need to go and play it right away, or even that you need to play it at all, but understand that it is filled with characters 
and stories that are both foreign and familiar to us, and embraces one of our more basic drives to connect with things that we don't quite understand, or even to a degree that we fear. Drawing from the cloth of cultures from around the world and across time, it runs the thread of your character through a world woven into a tapestry of folklore and legend, the pattern of which you can really only see if you've walked across the stage of humanity and stopped to inspect the enriching grain of the wood that is the arts. In other words, if you stopped to read a fucking book, went to a goddamn museum, or learned something about other cultures and their fucking art, maybe this fucking art will make so much more fucking sense to you. And now is my present to all of you as it is now 12.49 a.m. Class is now dismissed. Have a